Amen. Well, the title of my message is found there in Romans 3, verses 3 and 4. Romans 3, verses 3 and 4, which says, For what if some did not believe, shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. And the title of my message today is No Room for Doubt. No Room for Doubt. And the reason I'm preaching this message is really because, you know, as, as I've grown in the grace of God and as I've grown in my, uh, in my salvation or the time after my salvation, one of the things that you find uh, interesting or one of the things that really comes under attack is the flesh. And we, we tend to talk about the flesh and or the temptation of, you know, uh, the sins that we are most commonly associate with evil, right? You know, fornication, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. But as Brother Rudolph preached, sometimes the sins that are hardest to deal with are the ones that are of the heart, are the ones that deal with us feeling a little bit righteous or a little bit too puffed up in ourselves to deal with certain things. Or opposite, sometimes the doubt comes because we hear someone who we think is more righteous than we are and they say certain things that could cause us to doubt. But the reality is, what does the Bible say? It says, for what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? In other words, does it really matter what people believe? Does God stop to exist because people didn't believe? Absolutely not. There is no room for doubt when it comes to the salvation message. Now, what there's like, uh, uh, like it was said earlier, there's things in the Bible that we're not going to understand. I mean, you read through the book of Revelation, and even though we can understand it better and it gets better, there's certain things that are just left to interpretation. I mean, maybe we get through the book of Daniel or Ezekiel or some of the prophecies. We might not understand every aspect of it, but when it comes to the salvation message, I mean, there's more than enough scripture to back the fact that it's by faith and by faith alone. Verse 4 says, God forbid, yet let God be, be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. So a couple of things that I want to point out, you know, that I want to go there and turn to Romans 8, just a couple of pages over, Romans 8, while we're, we're setting this up. But, you know, one of the things that I want to make a statement on is that all lost people are in a state of spiritual doubt. And what I mean by that is, you know, when we as Christians doubt, we doubt in the flesh. You know, one of the things that, that has been true and that if you talk to anybody who's been saved long enough to understand, maybe they're not completely in the meat, maybe they have some milk, but spiritually they're growing in God's word, is that their doubt that they've experienced or the things that they've thought that they doubted all came from, you know, something they didn't understand or something they heard, but they never doubted their salvation. You know, because the Bible says, let God be true, right? And every band a liar. So if you're saved and the Spirit's in you, well, then you know that that Spirit dwells in you. And, but the flesh, though, that's a whole other, that's a whole other uh, game, I guess, or a whole other aspect of our life, right? We are body, spirit, and soul. And sometimes when we're in the flesh, well, then that's where that doubt or that moment of failing comes in or that moment of uh, wavering. And what happens is, for us, though, when we doubt, as Christians, we doubt in the flesh. Now, the world, they're lost in a state of spiritual doubt. And what happens is that out there, there's a lot of information, and I guess the best way to say it is there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of inf misinformation from the world. There's a lot of misinformation from uh, false religion. There's a lot of misinformation from scholars and PhDs and theologians and you name it. Everybody has an opinion, but at the end of the day, the way that we overcome doubt or the way we overcome ye of little faith is that we have to get into the Word and focus on God's Word. Because the challenge is that the Bible is very clear. There is no room for doubt when it comes to our eternal security. I mean, if, if there was room for any doubt, then maybe I should just close this book up and walk away. What's the point of getting up here and preaching the Word? But I'm not, let, let me not uh, 
belabor the point with my thoughts or the things that I think. Let's go to the Word of God, and then we'll come back to a couple of things that, that we've experienced. So if you go to Romans 8, and this is ta- you know, it's going to reference the flesh there, it says, There is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. And so what we see here is a couple of things. It's the flesh that's weak, and it's the flesh that has to be condemned, because the Spirit has an opportunity to move into uh, security, right? It says there, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin, and death for what the law could not do see the law is real good at one thing it's good at reminding us that we're sinners you know it's good at reminding us that we've all fallen from grace that we've all come short of the glory of God it says in that was weak through the flesh and then what does it say God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh and so see we see that the doubt where does the doubt start for the world it starts in the flesh But what I'm trying to address today is the doubt that we as spiritual Christians face sometimes. And there's nothing wrong with doubt. There's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, I mean, there's, we have just the example of doubting Thomas. We have uh, Peter who denied Christ three times. You know, you could call that a moment of doubt that somebody's calling him out. And he, instead of having that resolve to stand, he denied him three times. Now that was prophesied by Jesus, but still he's the one that experienced it in the flesh, right? Those are examples where we have that. And, and the Bible actually refers to that as the you know, ye of little faith. But what happens is, it's not so much what happens when you're doubting, but how you address the doubt. See, the challenge is that most of the time what's happening is that society is watering down the gospel of Jesus Christ. Society is trying to convince you that because sometimes we don't understand everything that's in the Bible, then it must mean that we don't understand the gospel that we don't understand what salvation is, that we don't understand what eternity is, that we don't understand how Christ died for all our sins and how He was in hell for three days. You know, they try to make it more complicated than it really is, right? You know, they, they try to tell you that, you know, three in one might not be three in one or that God is the Father, but He's not. They, they, they're confusing the issue, but if you read the Bible, it's very clear, right? And I don't want to get into a lot of tangents because then I can get off on a bunch of rabbit trails, but let me just say, since I addressed that, we believe that in the Holy Trinity, right? God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. I don't, we don't go around talking about one God, and, you know, he's the, it, he might be the God of, for the Buddhist, he's called Buddha, or for the Muslims, he's called Allah, or, you know, whatever, because then that, then it would justify people who say there's more than one way through Jesus, right? There's more than one, I mean, there's more than one way to, the, to God the Father. There's more than one way to heaven. But we know that He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Him. But let's go, let's look at a couple of things here that stand out. The reason that I do this is because, you know, for example, I, and I asked my wife. She, she said it was quite all right to use this. But my wife was saved by grace at three years old. That's not the thing I asked her about. That's, that's nothing to be ashamed of, right? But what I asked her was, she said, she, she agreed with me. I said, look, the few times that I've experienced spiritual doubt, you know, I mean, obviously, sometimes we doubt in things in life and everything like that. I'm not addressing the, the everyday mundane doubts. I'm talking about doubt in the fact that sometimes we talk about our faith. And what is it that we doubt? You know, maybe we doubt something we don't understand, but we should never think or let others convince us, because that's a lie, that we doubt our spiritual salvation, because there's no such thing. The Bible says, you know, if he paid it all, and if you're saved by grace, then you're saved forever. And that's it. Period. End of story. You know, my wife said that, that, that uh, she agreed with me because when she grew up, as uh, she got older, her parents uh, uh, went to like a seminar. It was called the Institute of Basic Life Principles, and it was run by this individual by the name of Bill Gothard. It was really popular in the 80s and the 90s, not so much uh, towards the later time, but it was a, a single guy who got up there and put himself in a position of leadership and wrote a bunch of doctrine based on the Bible, so it sounded good, 
and he gave you instructions on how to live your life, how to raise your family, how to raise your kids. You know, first of all, there's a red flag when it's just a single guy. And then he had a whole university and everything. But one of the things that, that was challenging for my wife was that they were always trying to convince her that it was Jesus plus. That's what she referred to it. She said, she said I, I hated growing up in that environment for the sake of just the fact that it was always Jesus plus. And what do you mean by that is that, you know, all saved may experience doubt. We experience moments of doubt in certain things. But the danger is with the Jesus plus crowd that makes you, that makes you doubt that eternal security. See, if you are growing in Christ, if you, uh, let's say, let, let's take a step back. Let's just use my example. When I was 25, I got saved. It was February 15. I mean, I remember the time. I'm, I'm an adult now, so it's easier, right? Then my wife was three. She knows she got saved. It's kind of hard to tell her. To, it's hard to remember a lot of things that you were doing when you were three years old, right? But when you're 25, it's a little bit more uh, specific. And, you know, it was February 15th at 7.15 a.m., you know, on the north side of Houston. I, I mean, I just, I wrote it. I, the only reason I haven't memorized is because I wrote it down. It was a big deal for me because I finally understood. You know, I grew up a Seventh-day Adventist. I grew up going to church on Saturday. I grew up not eating pork and not trying to eat shrimp and not doing anything on Saturday because I thought that would get me to heaven. And then I, this guy sits there and he shatters my entire belief system by telling me that all I have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm thinking to myself, well, what did I spend all my other time doing? Right? But then the other thing that came was, now I'm saved. Now I know Jesus Christ. And one of the things that stood out is one of the statements that made me understand my salvation more than anything was, after I prayed the sinner's prayer with him, he said, look, now you have perpetual rest. And I don't know why that stood out to me so much, but to this day, that's probably one of my favorite statements. I just never felt so much relief so much stress. And, and that salvation story is not the same for everybody. The reason I don't like talking too much about my salvation experience is because that's not your typical salvation experience. Most of the time, you know, we go out soul winning and people get saved and it's like, oh, did you believe what you prayed? Yeah. And uh, can you lose your salvation? No. And if we die and we never see each other again, we're going to see each other in heaven. Okay, congratulations. And then you move on. It's not like, glory, hallelujah, nobody saw light or, or had a big experience. So I'm, I'm real careful not to say that. But one of the things that stood out as he was saying that is that he gave me perpetual rest. Then shortly after, you know, my family and friends that were Seventh-day Adventists start to find out. And all of a sudden they start trying to pick holes at my ignorance in the Bible. And so things that they would say made me doubt certain things in the Bible. Well, you know, one of the things that I never doubted was my salvation. I was, it actually made my resolve stronger, right? So there was times of doubt, but the thing that happens is that, that they do the Jesus plus, they create a Jesus plus crowd. And what the things that they would attack was like, well, you're not going to church on Saturday? Well, no. Well, you know, God says the fourth commandment is, you know, you need to keep the Sabbath. And now, I mean, it's just fresh. And I'm so used to going for the last, you know, I was 8 to 25, so, you know, I'm sorry if my math is not great, but it was like 15 years of my life were spent going to church on Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, and Wednesdays. All of a sudden, now I'm told by the Bible that we're going to go on Sunday, and I don't have all the answers. I don't know about the Lord's Day. I haven't read all the Acts. I haven't read my Bible in its entirety. You know, there's things and there's moments of doubt, right? But it's because my faith had not grown. See, if we understand the gospel message, there's no room for doubt. There's no room for doubt on anything we do. And why is that so important? Because if you don't believe that to its core, then they can rock your core in any false doctrine. See, there's a lot of saved people today that are going to heaven, but they're causing others not to go to heaven or they're a stumbling block because they've fallen for some false doctrine that's out there. You know, there's people that are saved that think that it's okay to believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. And I'm not going to get into that right now. This is not the, the sermon or the point. But you know what? To me, the pre-tribulation rapture, before I even knew everything I knew about it, for me, was a cop-out. Because this week alone, you know, I always kept thinking, why don't people stand up for anything? Well, you know, if you're not going to be there for the tough times, why even get involved? You know, if, if you're not going to be, if you're not going to be there for the hard battles, what's the point of starting them now? You know, God will take care of that. But the reality is the Bible tells us that it's after the tribulation. And I don't mean to preach a message on the tribulation, but what I'm saying is that the Bible tells us these things are coming. You know, I wasn't even, when I prepared this message, this hadn't happened yet. 
but then it happened, so I'm going to address it. You know, there's a church in Arizona, and uh, they had four soul winners going out on Wednesday, uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. It was probably Wednesday. And they got arrested for preaching the gospel. Now, here's two things that stand out to me. Number one, there's no room for doubt. Those people that got arrested were willing to get arrested because they know that they stand on the truth. They're willing to go to the grave to preach the salvation message of Jesus Christ. The challenge is that when you put doubt, then you know what it does is it makes you lazy. Because, you know, you want to analyze everything before you even want to go out there and do the job. You know, you want to think it through before you decide, is this really what I believe? If you're thinking like that, then maybe you need to check, you know, your spiritual state with Jesus Christ. You know, one of the, one of the other things that really stands out, because these are the things that, that, that the devil attacks, right? He attacks, uh, he doesn't attack the salvation message directly. He comes in and he flanks it. And what I mean by that is, it's never direct. He always, I mean, most of the time when we run into people that say they're saved, they actually tell you that they believe in Jesus Christ. I mean, who's going to argue that point? The Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I know I just used that earlier, but no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So if I'm knocking on a door, if I'm giving the message, if I'm preaching from a pulpit and somebody says, well, I believe in Jesus Christ, I mean, that, that's a pretty easy point. But then the next part is, they say, but I can lose it because, you know, uh, I messed up or I didn't keep the commandments or I didn't do certain things. And what happens is we have to be aware of where we're grounding ourselves and how others are learning the scripture so that we know how to address it. In, uh, uh, while, while I finish this point right here, go to Matthew 6. But, you know, for me, like a couple years back, I've been listening to a lot of preachers and this group of individuals that I, that, that I work, that I uh, that I uh, fellowship with, and one of the things that stands out is they preach a lot on repentance. And you know, when I got saved, repentance wasn't an issue. You know, and one of the things is you're not really going to hear that doctrine, even though they do believe in it, from the Seventh-day Adventists. So, you know, for a long time, I didn't understand why it was a big deal. And then I realized this week and in the past couple of days as I was preparing for this is why was it not relevant to me? Because it wasn't relevant to my salvation experience. Now, talk to me about a false religion and my ears go up and all my, you know, senses go up and red flags and lights start going off because I came out of a false religion. There was a moment in my life where I was lied to for years Decades, you know, there was a moment in my life where somebody said, look, this is the way that you're going to get to heaven. And for years, I invested time and money and, and, you know, reading and doing the things that they asked me to do and going to the things that they wanted me to do and going through the rituals and the things to get saved. And guess what? It, it, it wasn't real. And what happens is if we don't have the gospel message correct, there's always going to be room for doubt. And what I'm trying to address today is two doubts. The world's doubt, because the world, they're doubting because they don't have anybody out there preaching to them hard and telling them that they're going to hell. And number two is, if you're saved, I'm trying to address your doubt, your spiritual doubt, I mean, not your spiritual doubt, your fleshly doubt, so that you can get out there and do the work that you were called to do. See, because I think most of the time that we don't do the work we're called to do is because we lack confidence. See, doubt is not not having faith. It's just that you're not co totally convinced or you're not in complete understanding of certain things. And so you might not take full action. You know, it's like, uh, maybe this is a bad example, but when I was, uh, you, when you were younger and you wanted to talk to a girl, but you didn't know how to talk to a girl, because, you know, you get to that age where as a young man, you start to notice girls, you doubt. You have doubt in yourself to approach that young lady or do some certain, or talk to somebody else because you don't know what to say. Or it's like that first time that they ask you to give a speech and you're real nervous, you're doubtful because you don't have all the information. But guess what? When you're, when you're confident in the things that you're doing, then there's no more doubt, right? Well, when it comes to the salvation message, it's not that difficult. People say, well, I don't know, you know how to give the gospel message. I mean, if you tell people that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved forever, that's a pretty easy salvation message, right? But then what happens is doubt creeps in because people come and say, well, yeah, but what about... You know, uh, you know, Isaiah, whatever. Or did you read that, that verse in Revelation, whatever? Or did you see that? And they think that they knew something, under the, something new under the sun. And the reality 
is that everything's been addressed and you have to just go and ground yourself in the word. It, and I know it, it'll all come together here, but go to, go to there to Matthew uh, 6. Go to Matthew 6, uh, verse 25. Go to Matthew 6, verse 25. The Bible addresses that. There, uh, there, there's times, and you know, for me, another way to uh, term doubt is ye of little faith. Meaning, you don't have faith, but your faith is still growing. And, and I'm not talking faith on Jesus Christ. I'm just talking your faith in your spiritual walk. So, for example, what's a good way to put this together? So, you know, when, you got, when I got saved, you know, that was settled. But, for example, um, switching careers, right? And doing something different because now I want to preach. That takes a lot of faith. And sometimes in that process... There's been moments of doubt because, you know, what am I going to do if I just go full time into the ministry or what, what am I going to do if if uh, if all of a sudden I change course and I'm more dedicated to the ministry and I don't have that much work? You know, where where's my income going to come from? Where's my the food on my table going to come from? How am I going to take care of my children? The Bible says that he's taking care of everything. Right. You know that he has given us all things. And through, all, through his riches, he's going to care for us. And I know of people, and I have examples, even here in this room tonight, of people who have taken that leap of faith, and God's provided for them no matter what. But let's go there to Matthew 6. Let's let the Bible do the speaking. It says there in Matthew 6, 25, it says, Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. See, he's not talking anymore about salvation. This is not a salvation message. I mean, I, my, my, the idea behind you being here is that you're all saved. This is a, let's get rid of the doubt and make no room for doubt. The Bible says, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. See, too often, we're worried about what's going to happen. Even with this, I'm like, you know, I was talking to my wife earlier this week, and I was like, you know, what if all of a sudden we get on this, uh, we, we support these guys, and then all of us are going to jail? Well, what if? What if we all go to jail? You know, who's going to take care of our children and who's going to take care of our families? You know what? That's not for me to figure out. The Bible says, take no thought for your life. Jesus is taking care of everything. He says, just go out there and do the will of the Father, which is to preach the word and tell people of Jesus Christ. Right? It says, therefore, I send to you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat. And I mean, this isn't part of the message, but might as well address it. This country and this world I mean, I don't know what's happened in the last 30 years, but everybody seems to want to just talk about eating. There's more eating shows. I mean, I travel quite a bit. I travel about every two weeks for business. And, uh, you know, you're sitting there in the, in the airport lobby, so, you know, sometimes the TV's on and they have the news. And even in the news, they have the eating segment and the taco truck segment and, you know, uh, I eat a lot of food challenge or I don't know what I'm making stuff up because I don't know what these shows are called but it's all about food right it says take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink nor yet for your body what ye shall put on well you know what's another thing that people worry about what they're going to wear and how they're going to dress and you know how they're going to buy their clothes it says it is not the life is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment it says behold the fowls of the air for they sow not Neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? By the way, that's one of my favorite verses because being, you know, five foot five and a half and growing up and being made fun of for being short when I was little, you know, when God showed me this in the scripture, you know, what peace, what peace could he bestow upon me than tell me that, hey, don't, there's nothing to do about your height. You're much better than any, any of the fowl of the air anyways. It says... Consider, uh, verse 28 says, Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith. See, he didn't say you were faithless. There's actually verses, when we're going to go there, where he's telling them that they're faithless. He says, oh, ye of little faith. And he didn't say that they weren't believing on him. He says, now that you've believed on me, let's start working on your spiritual walk. You know, let's start battling with that flesh. Let's start warring with it and overcoming all those temptations. 
Because the reality is that you're still, a, you know, a sinner. I, and I know I keep saying, but Brother Rudolph, you didn't know what I was going to preach, but you prayed on it anyways, is that we're still sinners, right? We're still tempted. But you know what? There's a difference between tempted into adultery versus tempted to eat that piece of chocolate cake. You know, I would much rather deal with the piece of chocolate cake and then work my way out of that into lesson and lesson. And hopefully, you know, by the time I get to heaven, you know, my goal is to just filter down the sin until, you know, the day that I die, maybe I don't have as much. But the Bible says we're all sinners. So maybe that's a, it's a presumptuous goal because what I look at sin, you know, God looks at it differently, right? So he's going to see things that I don't see in my life. And so might as well not even go down that road. Let's, let's ignore all of that. <laughs> but it, right here it says, in uh, verse 27 says, Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to the stat stature? Going back, it says, And why take ye thought for your raiment? I mean, for raiment. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Uh, like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Verse 31 <clears throat> Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or, where, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? See, when you're not taking thought into those worldly things, guess what? You're not having time to doubt. Because, you know, where does your worry and your doubt and your anxiousness come from? It comes from the fact that you might not have enough money to pay your bills. It, might, it comes from the thought that you might not have enough money to have, get a uh, a nice shirt and tie to go interview for a job. People think like that. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. We were out. So waiting for a couple hours, and my, my throat is a, <coughs> a little warm, but we're going to plow through this. It says, Wherewithal shall you be clothed? Verse 32 says, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek... Ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Right? And obviously we can take that list plus everything else that we don't even see God doing in our lives. And it says, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow should take thought for the thing of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil, there, uh, is the evil thereof. And you know one of the things that stands out, that stands out just, you know, in the last couple of years as I've grown and and we do more for the Lord, and we just try to, to, to live our life for the Lord more. And by the way, it's not a pat on the back, because the more you live for the Lord, guess what? The more temptation, the more attack, the more the devil's going to come at you. So, you know, you're not going to be free from, from all the things that you think of just because you think you're improving your life. By the way, that's on a side note, but that's the difference between someone who's living for Christ, they're saved by grace, and a false religion. Have you ever noticed false religions? Man, they have like the perfect life, according to the world. You know, uh, the Mormons, I mean, they dress good, they smell good, they even have nice haircuts, they have good jobs, they have a lot of money and retirement funds, nobody ever gets really mad at them, as long as you don't go to Utah and look at the polygamy, I mean, nobody really, I mean, Mitt Romney was a Mormon, uh, Harry Reid's a Mormon, these guys apparently are all, does that make sense? But when you're living for Christ, I mean, all you got to do is knock a door on a Wednesday afternoon in Arizona and a 56-year-old lady gets thrown to the ground and thrown in jail for preaching the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. So, you know, just I, I wanted to make sure it says, because it says, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. What is God telling us with that? He says, look, all you've got to focus on is the evil that's there. If you go out there and you soul win and you're out there reading your Bible and you're praying and you're spending time in the Lord, I'll take care of the rest. You just focus on the evil that's out there. Go to uh, Philippians 4.6. Go to Philippians 4.6. <clears throat> Philippians 4, verse 6. I like the way this verse starts. It says, be careful for nothing. In other words, there is no room for doubt. The Bible says, be careful for nothing. In other words, when do we doubt? When do we take room for doubt? When we're careful for things. When is it that... That, that uh, you know, um, I, sp I played a lot of sports when I was uh, growing up. Uh, to this day, I love playing basketball if I get a chance. I don't watch sports anymore because it's not about the sport anymore. It's all a political agenda and pushing the new world order and pushing whatever stupidity they're trying to push, all the uh, homosexuality and fornication and murder and thievery that's out there. But 
growing up, I like to play sports, and one of the things that they teach you is that they want you to, to, to do something so many times that when you're in the game, you don't think about it anymore. You know, one of the things that you hear is like, you know, I used to like Michael Jordan. This is before I got saved. But one of the things that they would say about Michael Jordan was that before a game and after a game, he would go and he would shoot thousands and thousands of free throws. And so then it was just automatic. It was just, you know, automatic. He never had to think about it. And I remember then in business, I learned, and I'm going to go through this quick, but maybe one day we can go through it quickly, is that your goal in life in a, in a, in a sales presentation was to get to the point where you were unconsciously competent, meaning that you weren't thinking about the things that you're doing. It's almost like when, uh, you know, you first, when I first started to preach, and even now, I would say that I'm in the, in, in the third process. There's four processes that, that we learn in sales, and this is not a sales presentation, but it's good for this message, is that you're uh, unconsciously incompetent. In other words, you don't know that you don't know. And so, that's kind of the world, right? They're in a spiritual doubt. They don't know that they don't know. The Bible says that you have to, you know, faith comes by hearing, you know. And so what's one of the things is how do the people that don't know that they don't know know? Well, you got to go out there and preach the word of God to them so that they know that they didn't know, right? And so then the next one is now you know that you know, or it's called uh, consciously incompetent, meaning now you know that you don't know. And so when, you know, when, I, when Pastor Cobb approached me about becoming a preacher, I realized I, I knew that I didn't know as much as I thought I knew, right? And now he's asking me to tell people about the Word of God, and now I've got to put this together because it's a big responsibility, and I realize I don't know. Now I know that I don't know. Then the next one is now you're consciously uh, competent, right? And what that means is now you know, but you've got to think about it. And you can still see that in probably my sermons to this day is, that I know things, but I'm still thinking about them. It's not unconscious. You know, I haven't memorized as much scripture as I like to. I haven't studied maybe as some subjects as much as I like to. And that's something that, you know, you constantly work on. I don't know that you ever get to that point in life, but there's certain subjects in the Bible that you can get to the next level, which is unconsciously competent, right? And conscious, unconsciously competent is just where you know and you don't have to think about it. You know, and it becomes second nature, like when you're out so winning, and, and, and you ask somebody, hey, can I, can I give you the gospel presentation? And they're like, yeah. You know, the first thing we need to know is that we're sinners, right? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For there is not one righteous, no, not one. All of a sudden, it's just natural. You're not thinking about it. You can actually address some of the issues. But if you're new about it, and let's say you're addressing, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the guy says, well, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. And now you're fumbling through your Bible, which is, there's nothing wrong. That's the way, the only way to learn is to do it, right? And you're trying to find those verses that maybe you had set aside for Jehovah's Witnesses or things like that. But the Bible says here, that's when you're careful for stuff. But when you're doing the will of the Lord, when you're in it, when you're just sold out for it, it says, be careful for nothing. Meaning, if we're focused on the Word of God, we're not careful for anything else. You know, we become unconsciously competent for the Word of God. It says, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. See, you're consciously, and then there's, a, there's another level that's not taught in books, which is the one that passes all understanding. God goes above and beyond anything that you could ever understand. It says, which passes all understanding, um, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So see, there's a process, right? It says you learned this, and you received it, and you heard it, and you saw it, and then you did it. And the God of peace will be with you. So as we're dealing with this, why is there no room for doubt? Because we're sold out. We're careful for nothing. Now here's the other side of the spectrum. Why am I addressing this? Because there is a difference between that and the faithless and strengthening your faith, right? The Bible speaks of those that are faithless. See, there's, there's doubt and there's faithless. Most people 
create doubt in a carnal sense if we're spiritual, right? But the world lives in spiritual doubt. And I, I would venture to say, based on what I've read in the Bible, that most people are lost just because they're lost. The Bible says that we're condemned already. They're not lost because they hate God. They're not lost because, you know, they're, they're, they, they're uh, subscribing to some false religion and they're just out to get every Christian and out to get everybody preaching the word. No, they're just lost because nobody's ever preached the word to them. You know, for as much hate as there is in Jesus Christ, it's concentrated in a few key people. I would call them the reprobate. We go door knocking week after week and you see the news and the attacks and these people got thrown in jail. And yeah, you know, it's a sad state and we need to stand up for our rights. And these four individuals, we need to be behind them and we need to be supportive of churches like that. But at the same time, in that same day, hundreds, maybe even thousands of people went soul winning on Wednesday and didn't get arrested. So God's saying, look, don't let this deter you. If anything, it should strengthen your resolve because there is a group out there like these people that arrested them that are faithless. Go to Matthew 8. And we're going to be in Matthew quite a bit, so just stay in Matthew. Matthew 8, verse 18. And then we'll, we'll start wrapping this thing up. It says, now when Jesus, Matthew 8, 18, says, now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandments to depart unto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury the dead. Then if you go over to Matthew 9, because I'm setting this point, point up, uh, 14, It says, Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but the disciples fast not? And then if you go to Matthew 11, 1, it says, And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. The reason I picked those verses is because it's talking about disciples. Because I'm going to make a point here in Matthew uh, 17. about the faithless, and he's addressing it to some of the disciples. You know, we have the apostles, and then we have the disciples, and the apostles were disciples. You know, disciples is just someone who's a pupil, who's learning, who's in a position of, of learning. And if you see there, uh, when I gave you Matthew 8, uh, you don't have to turn there, but 8.21 said, And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Obviously, this isn't the apostles, because the apostles were with him. They never left to bury anybody, right? And then in 9.14, the Pharisees, uh, then came the disciples of John. So it makes a difference that there's disciples of John and there's disciples of Jesus. It's talking about many people. And then in Matthew 11, again, we see that now John, uh, in Matthew 11, actually, we see both, right? It says, and it came to pass when Jesus made the end of commanding his 12 disciples, who also were the apostles, he departed thence to teach and preach in their cities. And then in verse 2 we see, Now when John, this is John the Baptist, had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples to go check on that. So I just want to make sure that we're not confusing. I'm not talking about the apostles here. And I don't think the scripture is talking about that in Matthew 17. So go to Matthew 17 so we can address this uh, point of faithlessness. And then uh, we'll, we'll close out. It says, And when they were come to the multitude, Matthew 17, verse 14. Sorry, Matthew 17, verse 14. It says, And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And you notice it's faithless, not O oh, ye of little faith. In other words, they had no faith. You know, there's a difference. Well, we of little faith, we, we're saved by grace, but we doubt sometimes. You know, we worry about money and we worry about our jobs and we worry about our careers. But these guys are faithless. He says, how long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could 
not we cast him out. And Jesus said unto him, because of your unbelief. There's that key, right? Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, there's no room for doubt. You're either in or you're out. I says, for verily I say unto you that ye have faith as a grain of a mustard seed. Ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. So these guys, you got to remember, and we can go back to John 6, I'm not going to go into that. There was disciples, and Jesus offended them in John 6, verses 60 through 66. And what did they say? This, this is a hard saying. And then after that, many of his disciples left him. And only, you know, Peter and the, the 12 apostles, because Jesus actually turns to Peter and, and addresses him, they stayed with him. And he says, look, you're a perverse generation. But here's the key I want to make. What was the challenge with this? He caused, you know, they were causing, or they were in danger of causing doubt on that man who brought their child to be have a devil removed. No, now today we don't remove devils like that, but it's the equivalent of somebody who comes sincerely asking about some doctrinal issue. And before even addressing it, we should check their salvation, right? But the challenge is we'll spend time arguing back and forth because we want to be right and we want to know everything, and then we never found out if those individuals were going to hell. And G what did Jesus say? He says, oh, ye faithless and perverse generation. And then he goes on to tell him, you, ye, are of your father the devil. You know, he's talking to those disciples. He said, uh, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, abode not in truth, because there is no truth in him. So they're so uh, faithless that now they're of their father the devil. And what are they doing? If you abide not in truth, what are you abiding in? Lies, deceit, you know, wrong, wrong doctrines, wrong roads, and you start watering down the faith of Jesus Christ. You know, these are disciples. They're, they were trying to learn. And we know that that is true, number one, because the Bible tells us on John 6, but also Jesus had 12 apostles with him. We know Paul was one that came after, right? And Judas was with him, and he was a disciple and an apostle at some point that was, a that was deceived and actually was possessed by Satan. So this happens, you know, in, in our churches and in our congregations and in our preaching and our teaching. We're going to run into people that are of a perverse generation. They're not doubting. See, doubt is not the issue. It's the faithlessness. They don't believe, and in their unbelief, they preach lies because they are of their father, the devil. So let's go and let's just, let's just clear this thing up because the, the title of the message today and you don't have to stay with me. We're going to close this out in the next 10 minutes probably. There's no room for doubt, right? So is there biblical proof for this? Is there, is there something that we can stand on to know that there is no room for doubt and that this is something that we have to work in our flesh to overcome? Because, see, the more we overcome it, the more excited we get about going soul winning, the more excited we get about preaching the Word of God. You know, I've always enjoyed soul winning but let me make something clear and this is a fault that i did not understand but still the bible says you know there's sins of omission there's sins of commission right this was my sin i'm going to confess the sin even though you guys are on the pole because is my sin of omission was that i would soul win one-on-one -on -one. i didn't do the door-to-door -door soul winning i didn't understand it i just didn't have that meat of the spirit but as you do it guess what happens that doubt that room for doubt that you had in your life, man, it starts kind of withering away. It starts to fade. And so what I, I guess the, the point of the message that I'm trying to leave with is when there's no room for doubt, there's only room for faith. See, as you remove the doubt, the faith grows stronger. And what, how do you do that? You do that through the Word of God. Uh, I'm just going to read through these. If you guys want to keep up, great. I'm not going to go that fast, but I will go fast. The Bible says, and he's going to give us different forms of faith or of strengthening, right? Psalm 126, 1 says, The song of degrees, when the Lord turned again to the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. 
The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, and the point I want to focus on right there, it says, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing sheaves with him. See, when we remove that carnal doubt in our lives, when we make no room for doubt, we go in doubtless, and guess what we're bringing with us? The sheaves. You know, all those souls, you know, I guess, you know, we could do it to, like a metaphorical, right? We're picking up the sheaves. And, you know, these represent souls. That, how great is that going to be when we just get to heaven and we're bringing them to, to the feet of Jesus? I mean, it's not going to be like that. It's just a, this is a, a metaphor. Uh, if you go to Ephesians 3, verse 14, it says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of the whole family in heaven and in earth, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. So we're doubtless, we're rooted, we're grounded. I'm giving you a bunch of synonyms for faith, right? In love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus through all ages, world without end. Amen. Jeremiah 17, 5 says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. See, that's the problem. Whenever we have spiritual doubt, I mean uh, carnal doubt, and the world has spiritual doubt, most of the time they're trusting in two men. A man that's leading a church or a false religion, the easiest one to pick on right now is the Pope. There's millions of people that follow the Pope. But here's the other man that we don't talk about that often, unless you're going to a good Bible-believing church, is this man. See, a lot of people say, well, I don't believe because I've got to do, and I've got to say, and I've got to read, and I've got to do. It's that Jesus plus mentality. They put their faith on themselves. See, what was the, the greatest sin that the devil you know, portray, I mean, that the devil executed on, on God. He says that he's going to be like the, high, the highest, right? That he can do everything because he's going to be God. And what is the devil trying to get you to do? He's trying to get you to think that you can be God. You know, there's, it's not a coincidence that we have movements like transhumanism. And I mean, you have idiots like I think Walt Disney's frozen somewhere because, you know, he might come back because whatever, well, everybody wants to live forever. But it's not a, it, it's not, uh, weird to us as Christians to know that there's people out there that believe that because sometimes we think we know better. You know, we can sit there. I was reading uh, 1 Samuel this morning, and you know, there's many times where Sa Saul thinks he knows better than God, right? We think we know better than what God has instructed us to do. So, I mean, I didn't mean to get off on that, but it's just, I said, it says, the man that trusted in man in verse 5, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departed from the Lord, for he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord. See, we put our trust in God, not in ourselves, right? And, and, uh, and, and for us, it's Jesus Christ, in whose hope the Lord is, for he shall be a tree planted by the waters." And that spread out, spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when he the heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. There's another way of saying no room for doubt. Second uh, uh, Thessalonians 3, verse 1 says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may, be, uh, may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. So there's the opposite, right? We're free or we have not faith, but the Lord is faithful. See, there's another thing. is when we put our faith in Jesus, but we're also working in our spiritual faith. Guess who's more faithful? The Lord. It says, who shall establish you. I love that word. Go, good old King James, right? And keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts in the love of God and in the patient waiting for Christ. Now, I got two more verses and then we're closing out. <clears throat> Psalm 40, 
Verse 1 says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit. In other words, he brought me up out of hell, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock. And we know the Bible references Jesus as that rock, that rock of salvation, right? It says, and establish my goings. He's not sitting around just wondering what to do. He's going out there and getting the job done and says, and he hath put a new song in my mouth. That's why even though we don't have a piano, we sing, because even if it doesn't sound great for us, the Lord likes it. It says, even praise unto our God, many shall see it and fear it and shall trust in the Lord. And then 2 Timothy 2.16 says, but shun profane and vain babblings. In other words, the reason you shouldn't put that is because it creates doubt, right? For they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that, that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So when we name the name of Christ, then now we've got to put the work in, right? It's not the other way around. And what's interesting is we had two examples of these verses. You know, we ran into Jehovah's Witness, and he said, hey, are you going to talk about resurrection? And I said, well, the gospel presentation is about resurrection. He's like, oh, well, we don't believe that. And I was like, oh, you're a Jehovah's Witness, right? He's like, yeah, and then we didn't get. But then I was talking to like an 11-year-old kid, and I said, look, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, what happens? And he goes, you're free? You know, I was looking for salvation, but you know what? Free is true, too. You know, the, it, you're free from sin. You're free from the bondage of the, of the carnal flesh, right? So he actually, was, he actually got me ready for preaching today. I'm going to thank that kid. By the way, he got saved. But well, that's, that's, that's a whole other conversation. But in conclusion, you know, God plans, uh, God's plan of salvation, it leaves no room for doubt. It's what we refer to as Christians as once saved, always saved. You know, one of the biggest things that I, I, I love about being saved is that I know that no matter what happens, I'm going to heaven. You know, because guess what? I make a lot of mistakes. I'm not, you know, I know I come off as real arrogant maybe sometimes and things like that, but I make a lot of mistakes. And I probably shouldn't say that, whatever, you know, there's, there's a mistake because that's what, what my parents have always told me when I was growing up. But, you know, that was before I got saved. After I got saved, I've left my parents' home. So there hasn't been that much of saying of, like, of stuff like that in a long time. But, you know, the other thing is with every spiritual battle and war, there's victory. You know, the Lord, you read Genesis all the way through uh, uh, Revelation. And what's the one thing that you're going to see is when God is ahead, when he goes before the battle, there's victory. So why should we even worry? Why should we even be concerned? You know, I, I, I didn't mean to bring him, but that's what I was reading this morning. That was part of my scripture uh, reading. And, you know, David had no room for doubt, and he went after Goliath. Everybody else was shivering in their pants. You know, their knees were knocking, but he didn't care. And then it says, the flesh may doubt. Remember my notes say, the flesh may doubt, but the spirit, it never wavers. You know, the one thing that you know for sure is that it never wavers. Now, the challenge is if we dwell a lot in the flesh, we won't grow. In our, in our walk with Christ. And then we won't do more for Christ. And does God want us to work for Him? Absolutely. Does He want churches to stop being lazy and making excuses? You know, they make programs after programs after programs to draw people in with no salvation message. People are just going to hell in a handbasket, but it looks good. But I love this church. I don't know how many... We don't even have that many programs. But you know what? One thing that we do for sure, we have a soul winning program. And not only do we have a soul winning program, I'm technically, I don't know that that's a, a, the perfect term, but I'm considered the assistant pastor. But you know what? Pastor Cobb is 100% supportive and behind that movement. As a matter of fact, anything we need to do for it, he'll put time and money and effort behind it. And that's what matters is that, that we have a program that's out there removing the doubt of the world removing the doubt of the false doctrines, removing the doubt of the false prophets, and just preaching the truth, which is the, uh, you know, the salvation through Jesus Christ. So saying that, I, I know I covered a lot, and a lot of it just, just came at, at the moment. I hope it made sense to you, but the, the thing I want to leave you with is, yeah, sometimes we have little faith. 
that's something we need to work in. But don't let that be an excuse for not strengthening your faith. Because there is a difference. There are those out there who are attacking and are faithless. And the challenge is that sometimes they seem to be working harder than we are. Sometimes they seem to be more zealous than we are. You know, people, I've heard this all my life. Oh man, if Christians were just as sold out as the Muslims, think what we would do for the world. Well then be sold out. Right? Strengthen your faith. Go out there and take no thought for tomorrow for what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear and what you're going to do. And just take, take a, you know, put on the whole armor of God and go out there and fight that spiritual battle. Sometimes people say, oh man, if I could just be like a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness where, you know, they're just so dedicated and so disciplined. But they're basing everything on their works. We're basing it on our faith. Why are we so lazy sometimes to fix that room you know, get rid of that room where we have doubt and, and, uh, and preach that free salvation. You know, we have a free gift. Um, and, and it's so easy to go out there and do it. And more times than not, we won't do it. Or more times than not, we won't do it because it's just not as exciting or as interesting. See, it's easier to be uh, self-righteous because then people notice. But it's harder to go out there and do the dirty work, right? Nobody, there's no glory in the soul winning. There's no glory in the prayer. Not here on this earth, right? Nobody's calling you and being like, hey, I saw you down the street. Great job. Keep it up. By the way, next time wear a brighter shirt so we can, you know, we'll film you. No, nobody's doing that. But you know who's taking notice? In heaven, what does it say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things. And see, I like that all because there's a bunch of all in there that we don't know about. Because remember, God, Jesus said he goes to prepare for us a mansion. And, he, and there's preparing things that we haven't even seen or heard or been able to experience. So we need to focus on our faith. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to preach uh, this message. And Lord, sometimes when I get a little excited, uh, you know, I don't know if, if I always stay on track on the rabbit. So Lord, I just pray that it was your spirit that filled in the voids and, and anything where, where I could have just gotten a little bit uh overexcited and, and uh, maybe tongue-tied or twisted. But Lord, more importantly than that, I do have the faith that no matter what, I used your word and your word won't return void. And not only that, your word leaves no room for doubt. So if I said anything, Lord, in, in my flesh that might have put a, a seed of doubt, I pray that it was your word that overcame it and crushed it, Lord. And not only that, I pray that as we go out there and to the hedges and the highways that we leave no room for doubt. We don't want to leave people thinking that they are headed to heaven, or we don't want to leave people thinking that there's an opportunity that's not really there, Lord. What we want to do is tell people in a clear, concise manner that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man, no man can come unto the Father but by Him. Thank you for all that you do, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.